is 1 John 2, 1 through 11. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness, and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. We can dismiss the children to go down to their individual classrooms. That's uh, kindergarten through fifth grade, and there is a nursery down there as well. So. I think Sean would agree with me whenever you prepare to speak something or about something, the Lord just brings things into your life to really drive the message home. My message today is called Confidence in the Light, and I have been less confident this week than I have felt in a long time. To remind myself where the light really is. It's not about the things that sometimes make me feel a false confidence. I don't know if you saw on Monday's Daily Bread, um, actually Sunday and Monday of last week were, were about children. And my wife works with children, and we love talking about children, the things you learn from children. But in this uh, Daily Bread, it talked about the, the author said, Mommy, look, the trees are waving at God. And she thought about this. And then she quoted this poem, just Three lines from this poem by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Aurora Lee. If you, you want to look up the whole poem, uh, but I love these three lines. Earth's crammed with heaven, and every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. And I started to write down this question. We talk about holy hugs and God winks, something where God unmistakably reveals himself. And I, that's what that just speaks to me. And I read this, how real is God to you this morning? How real is God to you? I mean, you're in church, so you know, I believe in God, so I'm going to be in church. And, and I love singing the music. That makes me feel good. And I love laughing and hugging and seeing people and hearing their stories. That makes me feel good. But I'm asking about how does God reveal to himself to you recently? Um, when was the last time? Thank you, God. That could only be you. Um, and then think about how he did it, because he'll do it differently every time. Uh, only one burning bush <laughs> that I remember in the scriptures, many, many ways that he showed up. Um, but where my lack of confidence started this week was the, the devotional I did on for YouTube and on for prayer meeting. And I called it Thirsty Prayer, and how we need to drink from the Lord. And you know, how he stood up in the uh, Feast of Sukkot, I think it is, the Tabernacles, and then he just said, anybody who's thirsty, come to me and drink. And it just, it, I would have loved to have seen that because it was the perfect moment because they were celebrating God's provision in the wilderness. But then there was another devotional recently about Moses. Moses was there for all those provisions. But the story about Moses is one where God answered his prayer and took something away at the very same time. If you remember the story, early in Exodus, they needed water. They were in a place where they were in a desert, it was not good, and they needed water. And God said, you take the staff that 
all those miracles that, that it was a sign of the miracles that I did. The staff didn't do the miracles. Go and you strike the rock. And he provided water for the people in the desert. That's exciting. But then the people were faithless to God and they were condemned to wander the wilderness for 40 years. Moses wasn't faithless. He's just stuck with those guys, those people for 40 years. And at the end of those 40 years, they are approaching the promised land and they go to a place called Kadesh and they are expecting, there's always water in Kadesh. There's always water there. No water. Also, if you go in that chapter, the very beginning of the chapter, his sister had just died. You ever feel kind of beat down? He's, you can almost have the enthusiasm, we're finally going to get to go in. We're finally going to get to the promised land. No water. And you know what? The children of the people that complained earlier, they're just, they just, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. They're ready to kill him. <laughs> they're ready to put him to death. So he cries out to God, and God says to him, Moses, you take that staff, and this time you speak to the rock. You speak to the rock. And he goes up to the rock, turns to those people, and he says, listen, you rebels, shall we bring water from the rock? And he smacked it twice. God gave him the water. The water poured out, fed the whole multitude, fed their animals, and then the next verse, it says, because you didn't treat me as holy, you don't get to go into the promised land, Moses. I, studying Jeremiah did something to me when I think about how long his ministry was. Just a hard ministry. And how did it end? Not so great on earth. Great in heaven, but not so great on earth. Moses, he got better than the promised land. He got to go home. He got to go home be with the Lord. And somebody in prayer meeting said, he also has visited Israel on the Mount of Transfiguration. His foot did touch the ground with Jesus. So I was thinking about that all week, thinking about how often I do not treat God as holy in my prayers, in my attitude. And I just said, Lord, what am I missing? You're answering prayers. You're providing because you, that's who you are. But I wonder what I'm missing. I wonder what I'm missing because of my bad attitude. So that all just sets up what happened on Saturday for me. Saturday I woke up and I knew, you know, it's fall kind of came quickly. It just dropped in on us, you know. I don't mind the cold weather, but I hadn't been able to exercise on a Thursday night for a while. And I was driving home Thursday night, it's dark. And in the darkness, I remember the Habakkers, they tell us when they were in, when they were in Siberia, they said, just imagine a gray world. A lot of snow and it's always dirty and just how you feel in a gray world all the time that's kind of what fall has brought in and it brings kind of a cloud over it's getting it's not light when i wake up um and it's it gets dark pretty fast tonight that's why we moved the thing to six o'clock actually i went back check my notes the man told me to set it for six i was wrong i put six thirty thing 6.30, the old habits die hard. Every, every weekend meeting starts at 6.30 in the evening. That's the way I remember it. But we're moving it up a little bit, so it won't be too terribly dark when you have to go home from that. So anyway, I wake up Saturday morning. I said, Lord, you know my heart right now. Could you show me some of the struggles with how awesome you are and how sinful I am and how I'm supposed to continue on? How, how is this possible? I went out, sat in my chair, opened up two devotionals. Those two devotionals were exactly what I needed to hear. Then I went out on the patio to talk to my lovely wife. She's having her devotions. We have a great time out there and just talking. And it was just exactly what I needed, just to talk with her. Then I went inside and opened up my email, which could be good or bad. You know what that's like. <laughs> and there was a great email. Exactly, and, and this guy sends emails all the time, but this one said, hi, Brent. Um, I, I, he usually doesn't make them that personal, but this one said, hi, Brent. It just moved, he said my name. And, and, and he writes to a lot of people, and he asked some really tough questions about the ministry, one of which I'll share. He said, if the ministry were taken from you right now, where would your spiritual life be? Would you still pray? Would you still witness? Would you still try to follow God? And I'm thankful that even though I started full-time ministry in 1985, 
like I have been doing ministry as a volunteer and just just I, it's just me. I, I don't think that I would ever leave it. It's not that. But there are times that your walk with the Lord can run dry. So I just saw two devotionals, time with Nancy, email, and then I got into the study where I thought God would answer, and he answered there too. It's just a day of God saying, I got you. I got you. So I think I can preach a message about confidence today. I hope that some of what I've been through comes through to you. First John is an awesome book. I, I, I knew it was awesome, but the more I study it, the greater it becomes. Where last week we said that the main theme for First John is knowing the God of light and truth. Knowledge relates to truth. Three themes in the book of First John, truth, light, and love. Truth, light, and love. So knowing the God of light and truth. But then I also noted that it's not an epistle. It's really a poetic sermon. And having left Jeremiah, which is not very easy to outline, I thought, oh, First John's an epistle. I'll be able to outline that easy. No, it's a poem. And you have to study that differently. You have to kind of look, and he just keeps repeating himself. So, so I'd like, if I think, if you think I'm repeating myself, I'm not getting old. I'm just following John, okay? So it's not me. But when he wrote it alongside of 2nd and 3rd John, 2nd John was saying, make sure you reject the deceivers, the false teachers. And 3rd John was, make sure you welcome the brothers. To me, 1st John all of a sudden came on with a new meaning. How do I discern deceivers from brothers? I'm just repeating some of the things we said last week. And as I said, it's not a linear outline. Here's a checklist. They check all the boxes, they must be a brother. That's not the way it is. It's a poem. And he just keeps these themes. The more you know the God of truth, the God of light, the God of love, the more you'll recognize when someone's a deceiver and not a real brother. And that's what we need to do. The more we know God, the more he will reveal and help us. So that's where we're going today. The message last week was rejoicing in fellowship. As we see the day approaching, and we can, you can't help but see the day approaching. We have a responsibility. I prayed hard. I didn't go last night, but I prayed hard for Franklin Graham. And I, I can't, I, I heard a few pictures and I heard a couple of good things. I don't subscribe to some of the papers that we've had it. FMZ let me down. I thought they'd do something on it, but they didn't. Um, but pray for all those that are yet to come to know the Lord before he returns. Rejoicing in fellowship. But today we're talking about confidence in the light. And my proposition today is we can walk in confidence as children of our Heavenly Father. Do you ever see a child that was kind of bullied by some other boys? And they kind of stay away from them, don't want any trouble. But when Daddy's with them, they'll stand there confident. My Papa's back there. He's watching over me. That's the confidence we find as children of our Heavenly Father. That's our hope today. So let me pray, and we will get into the first chapter, second chapter of First John, just the first 11 verses. Father, I thank you. I thank you for who you are, for the ways that you hug me, the way that you wink my direction, the way that you remind me that you are true, that you are always there. I pray that you would bless. I pray that you would show us yourself today. So that we can walk in confidence. There are many reasons to doubt. There are many things going on in our world today that we thought we would never see in our country. But our hope is not in this country. Our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is in you. I pray that you have mercy on me, a sinner, that nothing I ever say or am or think, nothing will get in the way of what you want to help show us today in your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first confidence that we can have is confidence regarding sin. That doesn't mean confidence in sinning. That's not what that means. We all, we, we don't need confidence in that. We're just good at it. Confidence regarding sin. And the verse starts in verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. What he's teaching us is what Paul taught in Romans. Sin is no longer our master. Sin is no longer our master. If you study Romans, and they have been, you read through the first five chapters of Romans, and you learn about grace, and you learn about salvation and the doctrines that support that. You know, if you're teaching truly the message of salvation, 
somebody's going to have this question. So what you're saying is, doesn't matter how much I sin, I'm saved. And if you're not getting that question, you may not be preaching gospel correctly. Because that sounds what, but then in Romans chapter 6, uh, I wrote the references down, you can look them up later. After all this about salvation, he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And the beginning of verse says, by no means. Or some say, God forbid. My professor in school said, heavens, no. We don't continue in sin that grace may abound. Grace will abound on its own. We don't have to walk in sin for that to happen. But then in Romans 6, 6, he says, We know that the old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Sin is no longer my master. I still listen to it as a master. I still stumble, but I don't have to. That's true. It's taught in Romans. It's taught here. I write these things to you that you may not say. And take note, the word children is found in this book a lot. This is the only place where it says my. It's a very personal message he's sharing right now. My little children. Boy, it's been fun. You know, Apostle Paul, he had so much going on. I'd love to have seen some. But to sit in John's feet at the end of his life, where they say, history says, he just said, my little children love one another. My little children love one another. So sin is no longer our master. Look at the last part of verse uh, 1. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Sin no longer separates us from God. Even when I sin, I am no longer separated from God. How do I know that? Well, I have an advocate with the Father. The Father loves me. He's given me a lawyer. An advocate, Jesus Christ. But it doesn't even mention here, but this is the Holy Spirit sealed me. He refuses to leave me. He says, I will be with you until I take you home. No matter how much you quench me, how much you grieve me, Jesus, God, will not separate from us because of sin in our lives. The call to worship that we read earlier talked about a high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses. He has lived in a body. He knows how weak this body is. And yet he did it perfectly. That's the hard part. Right? You know, he doesn't understand what it is to sin. Well, he understands sin, believe me. He knows how much we struggle is. That's why he loves us. He knows it's not possible for us on our own to prove our worth to him. He chooses to show us who he is and to show grace to us. So sin is no longer our master. Sin no longer separates from God. And then verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I have to say it. I guess they don't teach you how to say that word in liberty. They did it like Mr. Pablo Cops. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a tough word. We sang it once in, uh, in um, um, His Robes for Mine, Propitiation of Icarus, some of those big words that are there. What's the word mean, Pastor? Stop rambling. It means satisfaction. It means satisfaction. He is the satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And something else that we learned in my doctrine class at Lancaster Bible College is I remember writing my notes, and I'm a terrible writer, I'm a terrible artist, I just scribbles all over them. But I remember faces, drawing profiles, and I hope it's behind me. Hit that, next one. Oh, I didn't say that yet, did I? Said, God no longer turns from us, now the next one. All right. When we're dead to sin, God has his back toward us, and we have our back toward him. There is no fellowship. We are dead, we are separate. No matter how close we are, his back is turned, our back is turned. When the propitiation for our sin died on the cross, it satisfied the, the, the demands of sin so that God now can turn toward us. His, he now can look on us and he seeks to reach out to a lost and dying world. So he turned when the propitiation was offered. Prior to that, it was just temporary sins of atonement, uh, offerings of atonement, which would just cover the sin. 
allow him to work with the people, but the relationship he can have with the world now is different because Jesus is the satisfaction for the sins of the world. He died for the sins of the world. Now, that doesn't mean we're all saved. Doesn't mean we turn to him. What has to happen for us to turn to him? You've heard it many times in our study in Isaiah and, and Jeremiah. Repentance. It's a big religious word. But also means just turn. Turn to God. He turned to us in propitiation. We turn to him in repentance. That's where salvation is applied. The word vicarious is the application of the death of Christ. Propitiation is the satisfaction of sin. Uh, vicarious is applied to us because of faith and because of repentance, because of confession. There's a lot there. I'm going to go one more step in our, our uh, classes that we had in doctrine. Some of you know when I say the five points of Calvinism, what I'm talking about. The five points of Calvinism, people argue about it all the time. It's a great indoor sport in churches. You look it up online, you'll see all kinds of it, the idea. I have a major problem with one of the points. The others I'm willing to talk. I'm more of a Calvinist than not. But, but the one point that I don't agree with is what they call limited atonement. That Jesus only died for those he knew that would be saved. That his blood could only go that far. Well, we put this verse, when we were discussing it in our church, we put this very verse in our doctrinal statement to make it clear. Not only our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. The sins of the whole world. And some people who believe, no, it's still limited. That's talking about not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles are welcome. But it's still only the elect. And I mentioned this earlier in my prayer. Do you know God's mercy and grace is abundantly available to everyone who has a need? It's abundantly available. He says it's lavished upon us in, in, in Galatians. There's no limit to God's atonement. It doesn't apply to everyone because there needs to be a repentance and a confession and a receiving by faith the gift that is offered. How that works, I don't know. We can sing to him right now. I know not why. I know not how. But I know him. So we understand that God's mercy and grace is lavished abundantly on us. So we... Sin is no longer our master. Sin no longer separates us from God. And God is no longer turned away from us. That should give us confidence. I still stumble in sin. But that should give us confidence. We should have that confidence. The next statement about confidence is confidence in knowing him. See, I don't want to just know about sin and what God has done with sin. I want to know him. I want to know him. Look at verse 3. Uh, chapter 2 of 1 John. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. One of the, my favorite verses about assurance of salvation is in 1 John 5, verse 12. It's just to sum it up, is he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So if you're wondering if you're saved, just ask yourself, do I see the Son at work in my life? Do I see God producing fruit in me? So assurance comes with fruit. The fruit that he mentions here is obedience, um, keeping his commandments. Does that mean keeping them perfectly? I hope not. I hope not, and it's not. But we know that as we start to walk with God, his presence bears fruit in our lives. Matter of fact, John 14, 21, I, I don't have slides for these verses, but I wrote them on the slides. You can look up, the, and look up those references later. John 14, 21, I remember memorizing this on the school bus on my way to school in high school years. Whoever has my commandments and keepeth them, there's the King James sneaking through, he is a, he, he it, it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved of my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, if you take that verse by itself, you think, I have to obey, or he's not going to manifest himself to me. No, he's just saying, the one that shows fruit of obedience. Not perfectly, but still shows fruit. The one who shows fruit, I will manifest myself to him. I will reveal myself to him. I will make him know that he is known by me and he knows me. Oh, I just want to know him. I want to know him. Assurance comes with fruit, and I remind people all the times. Is there anybody here who is a spiritual fruit inspector? Do not raise your hand. You'll be in trouble. 
I am not the fruit inspector. You are not the fruit inspector. God is the fruit inspector. And he looks for different types of fruit, different types of people. He knows if we had a relationship with them or not. But I need to know. Well, continue to read. Assurance comes with fruit. Um, verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That doesn't sound encouraging. You mean if I, if I stumble and I disobey, then I'm a liar? Well, earlier in chapter 1, he talks about being a liar three times. And he says, um, those who say they have fellowship with me while walking in darkness. Okay, that, that sounds like the same thing. If I, if, I don't, if I don't live this life, then I must not be, I must not know God. But then later in verses 8 and 10 of 1 John 1, he says, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. If you say you have not sinned, you are a liar. And that's not just talking about before salvation. That's talking about the fact that sin is still present with us. Andy, did you get to that part yet in Romans? It's the, the, the battle with sin never goes away um, in this life. It'll be removed finally when we get our new bodies. And that's what we're hoping for. So we need to know the truth, the truth, and be honest about our sin still being a battle. Well, I got saved and I've been perfect ever since just introduce me to anybody who knows you, and I'll, I'll, they'll prove me wrong, prove you wrong. No perfect people allowed. In fact, I'm, I'm watching a show in the evenings, I've referred to it. Um, there's a guy who had a plane crash, and he got hooked on uh, painkillers. And a, they've been showing week after week his acceptance of his problems. He wouldn't call himself an addict at first. Then he calls himself an addict, okay? Then, then he's, he's making progress. But then this, the last show I watched, he stood up at a meeting, I have a testimony, and he said, um, I went to my son's house to see, I knew he had some painkillers, and I went into the bathroom, and I took him, and I had him in my hand. And I just have one question, does the desire ever stop? And that's how he ended. Sorry, that was a bummer, he said, and he sat down, but they said, thank you, call his name, that's what they programmed the, what they're led to do. Don't judge, just thank them for what they share. At the end of the meeting, the guy who was leading the meeting went up and said, you did not finish the story. Yeah. You didn't say you flushed it. You, didn't, you took it, didn't you? He said, yeah, without thinking. Popped it in my mouth. And he said, it's not good to come to these meetings hot, is it? He said, thankfully, that's not a prerequisite. You come just as you are. You come just as you are. So we need to know that truth. The truth of the song that we said. I come broken to be mended. I have more struggles than I care to admit. And I'm supposed to be something. I'm a pastor. And I keep going back to Paul. Three statements got progressively worked. I'm the least of the apostles. He said that in Corinthians. I'm the least of the apostles. Well, that's a pretty good group. So if I'm the least of the apostles, I'm still pretty good, right? Then he said, I'm least of all the disciples. And then in Timothy, toward the end of his life, he said, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the chief of sinners. If that's true of the Apostle Paul, who are we to try to lie to ourselves and act like we don't have hope, that we got this nailed down? So if I'm looking for assurance in knowing him, confidence in knowing him, I'll find assurance when I see him produce fruit in my life, even if it's just small fruit. He's the one producing it. I, I find assurance when I focus on the truth of who he is. And I am who I am because of who he is. And then assurance comes with love. Look at verses 5 through 6. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Assurance comes with love. There's three things I want to say about love. First of all, a couple of things. That it comes from the, the truth about his word. Whoever keeps his word. You know what that word is in the Greek? Logos. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So it's not just the written word. It's the living word who shows us the love of God. 
It, it's in him that truly the love of God is perfected. So when I think about love, I think about, first of all, I have to know that I'm loved by God. I have to know I'm loved by God. Then I need to know that by this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. How did Jesus walk? He loved the Father and he loved others. He loved others. When I understand that love, when I see glimpses of that becoming more and more real, and we'll talk about that in our last point, when love grows, when I see the ability to go beyond just I love you to I love you. I remember somebody talking about counseling a couple and said, I just don't love them anymore. I don't love, I don't love my spouse anymore. Well, God commands you to love all people. Can't do it. Well, God commands you to love your spouse. Can't do it. All right, maybe on this level. God says you're supposed to love your enemy. Can you do that? <laughs> We're not given a pass. Love is the answer. Love is what we need. That's how we find the assurance of knowing him. So this last point, verses 7 through 11, are about the confidence in love. Let's expound, let's expand a little bit. Again, this is kind of amplification, just kind of saying the same thing over and over again. But each time he's adding a little bit more. Look at verse 7. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Again, look how personal this is, beloved. I love you. I love you. I'm not telling you something new. And what I'm going to say here is love is what the word, capital W, Jesus commands. Love is what the word, written word, and living word commands. Love. How do I know that? If you take a similar verse in 2 John verse 5, 2 John verse 5, he's writing to a church, the dear lady. Now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, and there he says it in verse 5 of 2 John, that we love one another. That when, as he talks about commandments here, he is talking about that commandment. We'll wrap it up with a, what Jesus said in Matthew as we finish up this point. Love is what the word commands. This is an old command. It was taught in Deuteronomy. Jesus emphasized it. This is what we have heard from him. It's nothing new. And the reason he's talking about this is because there are people coming in with new teaching. They've gone into the deeper things of God and they're trying to, it's the beginning of the Gnostic heresy that it's the body that's the evil. And we have to, they don't, they didn't even after a while believe that Jesus came with a body. Because Jesus wouldn't submit himself to an evil body. They, they twisted it all wrong. He said, don't look for new all the time. I'm talking about a command that you've heard before. You need the love. You need the love. Verses 8 and 9. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I give ready you. Boy, sometimes they sound like contradictions. All right, it's not a new commandment. Okay, it is a new commandment that I'm ready you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. How is this a new command and yet an old command? He's saying love grows as the light shines. You know you're supposed to love people. But the more the light of Christ shines in you, the more that light, that love will grow. The more that love will grow. In fact, Jesus in John 13, 34 said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. That, that, that was kind of a, a light that came in that used to be you love your neighbor as yourself. Whatever you do for yourself, do for them. Jesus took it a little bit farther. He said, love as I have loved. Jesus, you died. I don't know if I'm ready to love that way. I don't know if I'm ready to love. But that's what he's saying. Love grows as the light shines. That's what's new. The more the light turns on in your light. But wait a minute. Pastor, you're always saying it's getting darker and darker outside. I'm not talking about outside. I'm talking about right here. I'm talking about letting the light of God grow in you. Because that's going to get darker and darker. But we have the ability, not just because we're light, uh, to start with, but we can grow in the light. 
Some of you know you had the same experience I had Friday night, uh, working on some things, and all of a sudden the power goes out. Flickered once, flickered twice, then it decided to go out and not flicker anymore. I'm sitting in my chair on my phone. Oh, the beautiful light of my phone. <laughs> and I'm thinking, do I want to get up right now? There's candles. I'm just going to sit here and give it some time. And then a, a light from the other side of the house comes walking down from their phone, except they turned their flashlight on. It wasn't just a glow. And I, I had a little fellowship time in the dark with my father in law. As he came down to see, he just wanted to see his whole neighborhood. Yep, yeah, it's the whole neighborhood. Because the only view he has is out in the backwoods, and you can't tell from there. So he, he came down and we thought my wife was already asleep. It was a, kind of, I don't remember what time it happened. The light rose. How many times I think that I have gotten up from my chair and I'm turning lights out as I'm going and I'm realizing it's getting get darker and darker and darker. <laughs> oh, I know the way. I'll just keep walking. Yeah. We're going to see what that looks like in a moment. And let me read it and then I'll talk a little bit further about this. Verses 10 and 11. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Love keeps us from stumbling in hatred. Love keeps us from stumbling in hatred. When the lights are going out, we are in the position where we are going to stumble. I try not to walk through the house anymore. Even though I can't feel my feet and I can smash them and it doesn't hurt that much, it's not a smart thing to do. Keep the light on. And this morning, I turned the news on. I was looking for something about the meeting last night with Franklin Graham. Couldn't find it. And then I heard this story, and it made me mad. The FBI raided a pro-life man's house. 25 people with guns showing up. The man with six children. And they took him out of the house. What had happened is this was a man who liked to gather in, in front of abortion clinics and just pray. And on one of the times he was accosted by somebody, his, his, I think a 12-year-old child was with him. And in the altercation, he pushed him away from his 12-year-old child. That man sued him civilly. It went through the civil courts and there was no case. It was thrown out. But now our government decides that we're going to make sure he pays. And now they're bringing criminal charges against him. That makes me mad. And then right after that, they show a picture of our vice president saying how proud she is that the attorneys generals around the, the, the different states are prosecuting and going after pregnancy centers. How proud she is. And I'm looking at that smiling face and I want to throw something. And I hear God say, you're not to live in that kind of hatred. She is not your enemy. The FBI is not your enemy. They are deceived by the enemy. I love them. Jesus died for their sin too. And I'm looking with favor on them, hoping that they will turn to me and be saved. That's the kind of light that it's hard to, to, to see sometimes. But that one quick moment, I was thinking, thank you, Lord. It's a great illustration. It's the greatest. I have to learn to love the people that are hardest to love. That's how it's a new commandment. The more, the more love grows, it grows in the light. And we can see that. Now I get a little personal. That was personal enough. This morning I was making my breakfast. I didn't feel well. I figured I better get something before I go over to church. Not a good idea to come on an empty stomach. And as I'm doing that, I'm putting some dishes away. And I kept putting dishes, and I, and, and I just got a little annoyed. And, and, and I'm banging things around, talking to the dishes and so forth. <laughs> and my lovely wife, remember the one on the patio on Saturday morning? <laughs> she comes in and she says, can I help you with anything? And brilliant statement, you use too many dishes. <laughs> what a stupid thing to say. <laughs> and, and I just... I said, you are going to preach about love today. Good for you. <laughs> and as I'm getting in the car to, to, to come over here after everything else was done, 
I look between the two cars in front of me, and we've been noticing all week there's a spider. He's pretty insistent on making a very nice web. And I'm sitting there thinking, I might be late, but you know what? The loving thing to do right now to that precious woman that puts up with me is to make sure that spider isn't there to greet her when she comes out. And I got in, and she came down and said, what's going on? He's back. I never had a chance because when I could turn around, he'd be gone again. But I knocked him down and I stomped on him, and I am the greatest husband in the world. <laughs> I didn't feel very loving, but I did the loving thing. That's what love really is. It's doing the loving, it's praying for the vice president. It's praying for the government when they are, are doing things to people that they shouldn't be doing. It's, it's, it's got to be darker and darker outside. We are light and shine, and we have to let it shine. Now, Jesus summed all this up, and this I did create a slide for. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Love keeps us from stumbling and, and hatred. Matthew 22, 35, 37 through 40 says this. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You think that you're going to walk and, 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 and be not walk in sin? The way you don't walk in sin is by walking in love. All the law and the prophets are resting on this to love God and to love one another. To love God and to love one another. If I'm going to grow in confidence, I want to see. I want to see love grow. The love is there because Jesus is there. I don't always show it, but as he shines his light, it gives me more opportunity to show it. My conclusion is this. As children of God, love is the key to a confident walk in the light. If you want to say you walk in the light, you better be focusing on the love that he calls you to walk in. And we can do so because we're children of the Heavenly Father. Our Papa, our, our Abba Father is there saying, I'm loving you. You take that love, love me back, and love others around you. In, in my study on Saturday afternoon, this statement came through and I, I liked it. God uses birth, not behavior or performance, to determine who you are. Oh, I just did something stupid. God says, yeah. But you're born again. In, in, in our pastor's group met two weeks ago, and we were talking about the same theme. Just God keeps bringing the same thought. What is the old man? What is the new man? How do we walk in holiness? What it, and, and we were just talking. And there were a couple of pastors there who believe you can lose your salvation. And I saw the one say, but it's interesting. When God says, I've given you eternal life, is God an Indian giver? He asked that question. And I said, yeah, that's the whole point. He does it. If he gives it to you, he's not taking it away. Yeah, but what about people? Well, we have to talk about that. It doesn't just give us freedom. So God says, if you're born again, if you've trusted in me, repented of your sins, and called upon me as Savior, I'm going to see you always as my child, no matter how bad your week was or how bad your day was. Legalism is not the answer. There are some people who put a lot of rules on you and say that's how you're going to prove that you're walking in the light doesn't work that way. Even unsaved people can do good things. Salvation comes from the presence of God. License is not the answer. Well, then, if it's grace, then I'm just going to keep sinning and let God's grace. No, don't give yourself a pass. God wants you, he, this whole chapter started with, that you may not sin. That you may not sin. Loving relationships are the answer. As I said, this is not a checklist on how to live the life. This is not a checklist on how to identify deceivers from brothers. This is knowing God as the truth, as the light, and as love. The more I know him, he will then cause me to love him above all, including myself. Stop being so selfish. Love God above all, and then he will lead me to love what he loves. He loves all people. He still will judge sin that is not repented of and not covered, not, how do I say it, um, 
that when they don't have a relationship with him, they reject the relationship with him, he will reject them. But for now, the propitiation has been paid and he is seeking to save the lost. As long as the world, as long as the church is left on this earth, this is the message that we have. This is the message we're supposed to live in. Um, there's some things going on in the news you may have heard about them. Uh, I don't know who to believe, you know, that the temple might be built soon, that the red heifers are being brought into, you know, I, I only half understand this stuff, but somebody that I rely on a lot says, they're not red heifers, they're, they're calves. A red heifer in the Jewish economy has to be at least three years old. Maybe it's in preparation for the red heifers that will be there. And again, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. Because the Lord's going to come when he's going to come. For now, he asks us to walk in perfect, not perfect, in growing fellowship with him. And that growing fellowship will be most seen as we love one another and love him. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the day that we have. I pray that you would bless us to, to know you more and more. I pray that you would cause us to walk in the light. That you would cause us to walk in love. And cause us to be honest and confess when we're not doing that. So that we can be cleansed from all unrighteousness. And continue to grow in the light and the love that you give us. Thank you for the truth of your word. And I pray that it will become more and more real in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a wonderful song, Trust and Obey. And afterwards, we'll take a moment and sit and just think about what the Lord might be dealing with us on, and then I'll pronounce a benediction. Take your hymn books, please, and turn with me to hymn number 571. Uh, we'll sing verses 1, verse 3, and verse 5. 1, 3, 5. Would you stand with me as we sing, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey.
And now, remember, you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen.